This is The Resilient Life, where we believe that every human will struggle in this life. Our challenge is to struggle well. I'm Ryan Mannion. I lost my brother to war, my mom to cancer, and I'm the daughter of a retired Marine. I'm also a wife, mom, author, and president of one of the nation's leading veteran service organizations. Join me and some incredible guests as we explore the value of struggling well through life's inevitable challenges. Welcome to another episode of the Resilient Life Podcast. Uh, I am really excited to welcome to the show today, Deshauna Barber, Miss USA from 2016, motivational speaker, and most importantly, uh, veteran in our United States Army. Welcome to the Resilient Life Podcast, Deshauna. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. Excited. You know, I actually learned your story. Somebody had sent me a video on you. I think it was one of those now this videos you see Mm -hmm. on Facebook. And I was so inspired by your story. And obviously for me, growing up in a military family, the the daughter of a Marine uh, and seeing that connection with you, you're the the daughter of two veterans and seeing that Mm -hmm. you were the first veteran to be crowned Miss USA. uh, What an incredible achievement. And so I'd love to just kind of get started with your background. You grew up the daughter of two veterans and um, you joined the reserves at age 17. Uh, Tell us about that journey. Yes, yeah, so um, I actually started a military scholarship at 17, um, and that really kind of launched my commitment into the military. I went into an ROTC program as a cadet at Virginia State University, um, did that for about four and a half years until I acquired my bachelor's degree and then commissioned into the military. So it was a long journey, I would say. Um, I think one of the things when you're going the, the officer route, um, you know, you're not attending like basic training camp oftentimes or going to AIT and doing those things within a few months. It's a, it's a long program because you're going through, you're aligning it with your college career. Uh, so it, it definitely had its place placeholder in my college career um, or at least my college experience. I think uh, one of the greater things about serving is, is all the avenues you can take to actually decide to join the military. So I am happy that I chose that route. I love that. Now, did you do uh, ROTC in high school as well? I did not do high, uh, ROTC in high school. Um, JROTC, I had never been exposed to. I really don't even know if my high school that I went to had it. Um, originally, I, I spent a lot of time in Minnesota um, from, I think, fourth, third or fourth grade all the way through high school. Uh, and we definitely didn't have JROTC. As a matter of fact, Minnesota is not really exposed uh, like much of the Midwest in comparison to the East and the South or South portion of the country there, Minnesota wasn't really exposed to military. There aren't really a lot of military bases there. Um, so I didn't just really didn't know much about the military other than what my dad told me and then what my mother had told me. So it was one of those things where I wish I would have had JROTC because I think I would have learned a lot more, um, about going that route, but you know, yeah, didn't have it. <laughs> I love the, the connection, again, with your, your parents both serving in the military. Do you feel like that was why you chose? Because I'm always interested, you know, I'm the daughter of Marine. I never, ever thought about joining the military. It was mm-hmm. not something that, and I didn't, uh, it was not something that I ever thought as an, a career path, an opportunity for me. Um, and my brother was the exact opposite. You know, he was wearing my dad's Marine Corps uniforms when he was eight years old. And uh, I I knew that he was driven towards that uh, at a young age. Um, But my parents never drove him towards that, just like they weren't Mm -hmm. driving me away from it. Um, So I wonder like how you feel your upbringing, how that affected the choices that you made. My dad and my mother both encouraged us very strongly (laughs) to join the military in some way, shape or form. So uh, both myself, my sister and brother all joined the military around the same time, really within three years of each other, because we um, all went to high school within three years of each other as well. So um, 
they really use the military somewhat as a like launching pad in terms of disciplining and, and introducing us to adulthood. The military just has so many opportunities that both of them had a chance to experience. So that was one of the main things was the opportunities, but we also feel like it's somewhat of a family tradition to join the military. We feel as though, you know, an opportunity, whether it's three years or 20 years uh, to, to serve this country is something that is really important for our family. Um, yeah, just kind of just a form of patriotism, but it's just really just about, you know, our, our commitment to the freedoms that this country offers. And uh, we believe heavily in that. So we, it wasn't really, I wouldn't say it wasn't a choice. It was just a strong suggestion. You know, our parents are, you really have to, it's just a strong suggestion. So yeah. it, it was no way that I wasn't going to join in some way, shape or form. I just went the different direction in terms of becoming an officer. The rest of my family has been uh, serving as an enlisted soldier. Fantastic. So, okay, let's talk about pageantry. How does that fit in as a officer in the army? How do you get introduced to the world of beauty pageants? It really came out of nowhere. I was between my freshman and sophomore year um, of college and uh, I was working a summer position at Target and a lady walked up to me who happens to be a pageant recruiter for um, the state pageant in Virginia. And she walked up to me very bravely um, and said it after somewhat of an interrogation session um she asked me all these questions and then went on to say that she thought I'd be an amazing uh competitor for the local Miss Virginia USA pageant and then go on to win Miss USA uh, she was very convinced this woman and um she was somehow able to persuade me to meet her at Starbucks uh after my shift the next day which I did and she we had really awesome convincing skills and somehow we got around to me registering into the state pageant which was Miss Virginia USA at the time and I went through after the first competition because it's only once a year um, so I remember when I was actually competing the first year I felt just like this door opening in my mind um, I think coming from a military family femininity and dresses and you know makeup and cute hairstyles and stuff like that is not something that I was really exposed to growing up my mom was nothing like that <laughs> um and and even to this day you know when people see me in public and even right now you know I'm not done up and stuff like that I'm not really a makeup person actually I only wear it when it's necessary <laughs> um so there's I think pageantry kind of opened up two sides of Deshauna it really showed me that you know, there's there's different elements that come with my personality, especially when it comes to being a woman and when it comes to being feminine. Um, and I just fell in love with wearing dresses and looking pretty and, then you know, being able to, you know, take the dress off and go back to my jeans and my top and, you know, my, my tennis shoes. So it was just so interesting to be able to see my fascination with this side of myself. And I also love the platform that pageantry offered me being able to have, you um, whatever it is that you want your your focus to be or your nonprofit to be focused on. But my, my platform was always serving this country and, and, and encouraging people to support our veterans. So it was a combination of loving the, the feminine side of Deshauna and then a combination of being able to use the platform to be able to, you know, encourage people to know what it is that you're passionate about. So it's kind of a combination of the two. And the unfortunate part was the long journey that it took to getting there. Now, I appreciate the long journey that it took, but it took me seven years to finally win my state title. Um, so I competed every single year. The competition is only once a year. I competed every single year up until I won on my seventh try. And that's when I won Miss DC USA and then went on to win Miss USA. So um, I think the military portion of me kind of kicked in after each loss just the tenacity and the resilience was something that I really maintained. I knew that giving up was not an option. I think that's when like the military, Deshauna kind of stepped in and said, okay, we're not quitting. And so we win. And obviously that paid off because I went on to, again, win Miss USA and then place top nine at Miss Universe. So it all ended up working out in itself. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where the different personalities of Deshauna, not that I'm, you know, had multiple personalities, but kind of the different sides of me definitely played into each other uh, to getting me to where I am today. Sure. And what a kind of incredible platform. Number one, I love that you say you're, you're the military Deshauna kicked in because mm -hmm. 
you know, just that, that idea of like, Hey, got knocked down. I'm going to do it again. And, and I would imagine that there's probably a lot of people in that space that, um, can kind of get kicked down and say, all right, maybe this isn't for me. And I mean, you're a young girl that's discovered at target. You know? <laughs> yes. So like, you know, you go and you give it a try and maybe you don't, you don't do that well. And you think, okay, well, you know, maybe that woman didn't know what she was thinking, but you're like, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to keep going for this. And what an incredible opportunity too. The one thing that I love about it is that the platform to advocate for supporting our veterans is one thing and, and amazing, but also the platform that I am a veteran. So mm -hmm. you know, this idea that there's this, there's this stereotype about what a veteran is and specifically mm -hmm. a female veteran. And the, the idea that like, no, a female veteran can, can be Miss USA. You know, we can right. still embody the femininity to, to become Miss USA, to place ninth in the Miss Universe pageant. I mean, that's huge. And I think that opens up so many doors for, for young girls. You know, I think about my own daughters and, um, you know, the, the path that they're on. And I, I am definitely more encouraging of my kids choosing a life of military service, even my daughters. And, you know, one of the things I always talk to my daughters about, because my, my oldest is a freshman in high school. So she's really mm. starting to make those decisions right now. And their connection with the military is obviously their grandfather, but their uncle who died in combat. And so I'm trying to explain to my daughter, you don't have to be a combat Marine. You can be a mm -hmm. communications officer. All the things that you can do in the civilian world, you can choose to do them in the military as well. And so right. it's kind of opening that door to, to see all these opportunities and possibilities as a female of what they can do in the military. And, you know, that's hard when, you know, the images they see are all men holding guns in battles, right. right? And so mm -hmm. I love this story and I love, again, everything it represents, not just for the military now, but for the young women that are thinking about pursuing that avenue. Um, it's incredible. And um, I, I definitely want to link this, the story I saw of you, um, that now this piece, uh, we'll link that in our YouTube episode, because I just think it tells such a fantastic story of your journey. And it was so beautifully done. So we'll make sure we link that up. Um, what what do you feel like? How do you feel that your military service has shaped who you are today? Uh, you talked a little bit about that in terms of like not giving up, but uh, as you move forward, and we're going to get into some of your current work with Swan, like what do you think the biggest takeaway is from the military that that has helped shape everything that you do? I think the military probably has the biggest impact on my perseverance. I, you know, you're growing up, you're coming out of high school and stuff like that. You're this, you know, teenager and walking into college, Mrs. Cool Girl. And, you know, you don't really have the opportunity to have like life shake you up. You feel like, you know, the life is in your hands, which it is. Um, but it's almost this uh, spoiled mentality that I, that really just, was pulled out of me easily by joining the military just because um, we went into the field so much as cadets and uh, we were put in situations we didn't necessarily want to be in as cadets. And, and even, you know, after joining and commissioning, there's just so many things that you have to push yourself through and there really is no other option but to get through it. So perseverance is one of those things that I don't know if I have ever naturally had I think it was something that had to kind of be banged into me where, you know, life is not always going to be what we want it to be. And life is not always going to have the door open that we want to open, but it is our responsibility to keep fighting and to keep trying. And I think that you see so many situations where you really have no choice, but to either push through or to give up and giving up is something that I refuse to do when it comes to really anything. So I think just the, the challenging aspect of it. And then I think the next thing that the military has probably taught me that just, I'm proud to be a woman. <laughs> um, and I know that people are like, why is that? Why is the military taught you that? Well, the military taught me that because the military is a male dominated space. 
And if you don't walk into your unit as a proud woman, a confident woman, someone that knows who knows what you want, knows who you are, um, knows what your morals, your ethics, and your beliefs are, and you're willing to stand on that, um, the, the military will eat you alive. <laughs> and as a woman, you have to be able to know how to command a room and um, gain the respect of your male comrades and female comrades. And you have to be able to understand that you need to be a little bit tough. So this, this, you can't sh shrink into your shell when you're in some of these spaces, especially as a leader. So I definitely think it's made, made me feel even more proud to be a woman and to be a strong woman and to, you know, push myself to be a great leader when it comes to a lot of the people that I've worked with. I love that. It was actually something I wanted to, to dive into more with you because, you know, I'm not, I don't, and, and in serve in the military, but I lead now one of the nation's leading veteran serving organizations. And, and just like the military, the veteran service organization world is heavily male dominated. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've found, and, and I don't, I don't want to say that I feel like I've been challenged in that. I feel like I've been accepted, but I also feel like I walk into the room expecting to be accepted. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I know that feeling of going in and, and sometimes having to be overly confident and, and continuing to tell yourself, like, I'm here because I deserve to be here. Right. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've battled with that a lot of times, you know, I lead this organization that represents all these veterans. I didn't serve. And, and I rely heavily on the fact that, you know, I'm a military child. I grew up in a military family. And, and so that means something. And, um, you know, but when I'm sitting in with a group of guys that were all, you know, combat service members, and they're talking about this and that and, and dif different things that, you know, maybe didn't directly affect me, but, but at the same time, I feel like I'm as knowledgeable about them as, as they are. Um, mm -hmm. I get that challenge. And I love that. I love that you say that the military helped you to appreciate how great it is to be a woman. I, I actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, on some level, I feel the same way. You know, I, I'm never feeling like, oh, I, you know, it's so challenging to be a woman in this space. I'm like, no, I'm glad that I'm a woman representing a female perspective to, to things and how we approach things. Um, what do you, what do you think? Have you, of course, you know, it's very evident you're, you you're very strong, you're, you're confident, but like, talk to us about some of the challenges. What have been some of the challenges uh, in the military as a female and, and how have you overcome them? Well, there's a plethora of challenges. Um, I, I definitely think probably one of the biggest of challenges that comes with being a female in the military is just the, the sexual harassment. You know, I've had my fair share of cat calls and stuff like that. Um, I think that even when I won Miss USA, all those things kind of died out, which was great. Um, but differences in opinion definitely increased. <laughs> so you have a lot of people that um, either serve or have served and don't necessarily agree with a soldier, you know, walking on stage in a swimsuit, I don't think it's a big deal, but you know, there, there were a, a large level of opinions specifically because when I went to the Miss USA competition to compete, my platform was talking about how it is that we can better serve our veterans and make sure that they have the resources that they need when they return from deployments. So I put that portion of my life, the military portion of me on the forefront, it was featured in my road to Miss USA video. Like they showed myself in uniform during the, during the broadcast and all of that. So it was something that I was promoting. And then here I do, here I come walking outside, you know, on stage in a swimsuit. And there were a few articles actually um, from veterans, uh, some of which had their own like blogs and stuff that were sent to me where they did not agree. Um, they felt as though my win set women back years um, in terms of progress. And I was like, wow, I'm pretty powerful to have set us back so many years <laughs> in progress <laughs> just because I walked on stage in a swimsuit. Right. Um, so it, it was, I felt the biggest challenge for me pre Miss USA was, you know, 
the 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 not so great apples within the military, the bad apples um, that did not have a respect for women, in my opinion. And then post Miss USA was the the disagreements that people had with me having the title because I felt as though I was really opening a door and I really think that I did in terms of showing that women we don't have to be boxed in when it comes to what it is that we want to do really nor do I need the validation of anyone to chase my dreams they're my own personal dreams and I don't have to necessarily justify them to anybody so but you want people to celebrate you. You want people to celebrate what it is that you did and the things that you've been through to get there. So, you know, 98%, I think of service members and veterans agreed and loved it. It was the 2% that I had a tendency to focus on where I'd be reading these articles and Googling the diff the, the differing opinions. And for a while, it kind of dragged me down a little bit. But I think that I needed to see that. I needed to recognize the fact that not everyone is going to agree with everything that we do um, in life in general, and that I still need to stay the course. Um, I'm still in the military now. I'm going on 11 years now. Um, so, and I, I have no intentions on getting out anytime soon, being a reservist. So to me, wearing the uniform is a long-term thing, and there's going to be awesome things that happen within the time period of my service. And I want people to know that I'm not serving for the glitz and the glam of it all. Cause if I did, I would have gotten out after Miss USA. <laughs> I'm serving cause I really believe in it. And I'm serving because um, it's something that I know I want to continue to be a part of my life. And I want my service to show people that there's so many things we can do. It's just these, these, these crazy notions of limitation that people have when it comes to limiting ourselves and not feeling like we can't do the things that we want to do. Um, so for me, it was really showing military women that you can be more than a soldier. Um, the military, the, the army actually came out with this really awesome calendar in 2019. It was a 2019, 2020 calendar. And the, it was and a soldier and more. So each month featured a different service member that was doing, not only serving, but doing other things. And I was, I think I was March. Um, which was interesting to say, yeah, but I was March and there were like, you know, Olymp Olympians in there and, and people that were different sports and stuff. So I think the military is actually getting to the point where they're starting to embrace people that have outside lives outside of the uniform. I think that's really important. Um, so I appreciate that portion of it. Yeah, I think so too. I love that. And I know that that's, um, that's part of your message more than, you know, you, you, you uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I think again, presenting the, the aspect that you can be more than a soldier, you can be more than a Marine, you know, mm -hmm. and you can, you can serve your country and still pursue those other dreams, those other aspirations. And, um, but I, I do have to say, uh, I like you and the person that if I do something and a hundred people <laughs> like it and one person doesn't. I focus on that one person. That one person, yeah. That, that's actually one of my, I, I, I call it a flaw because, you know, sometimes I can put you in a really bad place and you try yeah. to pull yourself out and, and, you know, to focus on the positive. And regardless, you know, what I've, what I've come to realize is even Mother Teresa had, yeah. you know, and so- yes at the end of the day, you're never going to make every single person happy. But if you are true to yourself, um, th that's the best we can do as humans, as, as people. So, um, so don't focus on, don't focus on that 2% because it wasn't <laughs> even, it wasn't even a thought in my head that actually anybody would have ever had a problem with it. I thought mm -hmm. what an empowering, uplifting story for females. Um, mm -hmm. and I know the idea of pageantry is maybe a little bit antiquated, but mm -hmm. when you look at what it is, it's it's a production to help women find their confidence, right? And find right. their strength. And so I get that. Um, uh, so I love it. I love it. Um, well, tell us a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about SWAN. Um, the Perfect. Service Women Actions Network. On the site, it states that the organization shapes outcomes 
of many important issues affecting military women, including opening military jobs to service women, expanding access to services for a broad range of reproductive health care services, working to hold sex offenders accountable in the military justice system, and eliminating barriers to disability claims for those who have experienced military sexual trauma. Um, yes. Let's talk about what you're doing at SWAN. And you know, again, I'm reading what it says on the website, but I want to hear, I want to hear about the work of SWAN. Thank you for reading the summary, because sometimes actually it can be hard for me to go through like each specific of, of what it is that we do. So that's kind of like our really like ex, um, extract of uh, what it is that we do as an organization. So in 2019, I received an email um, that said CEO position for Service Women's Action Network open. And I immediately applied. I had been focused on motivational speaking for about two, three years full time, right after Miss USA was over, I did, was motivational speaking for years. And that was just my full time focus. And I felt as though I was not living fully in my in my purpose. I knew that I needed to get back to, to serving our veterans in some way, shape or form. And motivational speaking just wasn't the purpose of that. Um, that was just all about inspiring everyone. So when I got the, the email and it was just blasted, it wasn't a special email sent to me. It was just blasted out to the community and people that were listed on their newsletter. And I applied immediately and went in, went through like a two month um, interview process and background checks and things, all these. And I went through and accepted the position in January of 2020, just in time for COVID, um, just in time for a nice global health pandemic to happen. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like the perfect time to spend your first year as CEO. But when I walked into SWAN, I've made some changes since becoming CEO, but the primary focus of SWAN has always been to be the, uh, the research and advocacy organization dedicated to women's needs, specifically service members and female veterans. So when we're talking research and advocacy, because that can be so many things, we are based in DC and our focus is on legislative change. We're not necessarily a direct services organization. We offer a few forms of direct services, but if there's like a, a female veteran that is homeless, you can't necessarily come to us and we have a home waiting. Our focus would be on what type of legislation is available to make sure that homelessness is not necessarily a primary issue when it comes to female veterans, which it is actually, um, but if we're, if we're getting into the weeds of things, but our focus would be on the foundational issues that is in the military and what generations we can impact by passing legislation that impacts female veterans and women's service members in the future, um, apart from the, the, the single service issues that are taking place right now. So we work alongside with congressmen and congresswomen on both sides of the aisle on being able to help them with legislation. A lot of the times when you're dealing with um, people on Capitol Hill and people that work in government, they don't necessarily know everything when it comes to issues. So when they're writing legislation, they don't necessarily know the specifics of what the issue is to even be able to fully write out what it is that needs to change. So we have long-term veterans that are um, expert in government relations that help them write out legislation specific for the military. We are that subject matter expert that works alongside congressmen and congresswomen to be able to make that impact. So that's one of our primary, 100% primary things. The second portion of working on alongside uh, congressmen and congresswomen is the research aspects. A lot of times no one wants to make change unless they feel like change needs to be made and you need to have actual data to prove that. Right. So we have numerous research fellows that do surveys and do um, really, really nice white paper documents that are based in real concrete evidence-backed research to show this is a real issue for women. Here's why, here's the research that we've done. So we have a large research section of, org of our organization that's based in providing that to Congress as well. The, the third portion is when the organization was founded in 2009 by uh, group of women veterans, they found that when they go to veteran service organizations, no matter who they are, or where they are, that there is this lack of women specific services that almost every large VSO offers. They found that 
hole in the wall and decided to fill it by creating Swan. So when they created Swan, we spent, they spent years, because this was before my time, they spent years being able to create a resource portal of vetted organizations that have verified and shown us that they provide women specific services for almost every issue. So we consider ourselves as an organization a one-stop shop for women veterans and female service members. No matter your issue, we have the solution. And if we don't, we'll go out and find it. Um, so our resource portal is kind of the backbone of our organization. It's open and free to anyone and everyone. Let's say you have someone that needs therapy. We have it broken down by states where they're all pro bono services for females. And you can go in and say, okay, I need this or I need that. We have a homelessness section. We have a legal services section. We have a, you know, therapy and mental health section. We have all these sections that are filled with better organizations that offer pro bono services to women. And that's kind of our, our bigger driver. That's the third portion. Now, the fourth portion is where Deshauna comes in. <laughs> um, and it's kind of been my, my change for SWAN. I found, and although I sat back for about six months and kind of just observed and led, I didn't start really making changes until a little over six months in. I felt that SWAN was not loud enough, <laughs> to put it into good terms. Yeah. I, I felt as though we do so many great things, but no one really knows about it. We're not like the USOs and the IAVAs and the Operation Home Fronts. Those are organizations, in my opinion, that are loud and proud about what it is that they do. I didn't feel like SWAN was loud enough. So when I came into the organization, my focus was on promoting, promoting, promoting what it is that we do. And we had the amazing blessing of being able to partner last year with Olay and Walmart. And they made a cream, a camouflage cream. Oh, it was no so way. cute. It was so cute. I have to send you the link. Um, but it was basically a, a, um, an eye cream, like a facial cream. And they, it was a limited edition. They only made a thousand bottles and they made it camouflage in honor of female service members and women veterans. And we did this partnership. It was, I believe last August and September, it was on Good Morning America, limited edition, it sold out within maybe two weeks of us launching it. And um, they donated $250,000 to us after, um, after they raised however so much money. So they $250 per bottle sold, even though the bottle was only like $18, they still yeah. gave us 250 per bottle, which was awesome. So again, an opportunity for us to say, you know what, let's find creative ways to showcase and celebrate women. I don't know if women veterans feel celebrated sometimes. So this was a really awesome opportunity for us. So that's where Deshauna comes in is being louder um, and, and finding almost tangible ways to be able to show women veterans that we see you, we recognize you and we celebrate you. So that was really cool for us. I year. love that. <laughs> and, and it's so true because when you think about the, I mean, again, I'm, I'm in this space too. I, I, I know I hear every single day, the challenges that, that our female veterans face, that there are a different set of challenges, but when you look outwardly and especially when, you know, you're trying to drive to the general public awareness for our military community as a whole, um, you know, it becomes hard to like segment out like, okay, let's make sure we're talking about the female veterans and right. to have someone leading a group that does just that. And, and even when you talk about the, the Olay, the cream, there's so many incredible like cause marketing campaigns and we've been a part of many of them um, throughout the years for veterans. Um, but I've, I've never seen one that's been specific like that to female veterans. And what a cool thing. Mm -hmm. because imagine being a woman going into Walmart to buy your eye cream and seeing this camo. And, you know, it's just that realization like, oh my gosh, I'm picking this up. And there are women that are using mm. the eye cream that are serving in the military. I mean, just that full circleness. Uh, I love that. And, you know, I think the idea that you continue to advocate, right. You're, you're still serving. Um, but that you've taken that step from, uh, you know, uh, full-time service member to working in, um, the, the pageantries and, and, bringing a platform, I would say, to, to veterans and female veterans particularly. 
but now to move to that next step of advocating. And that's so incredibly important um, because, you know, sometimes you got to put your head down and you got to say, okay, how are we going to fix this? And I think the, the legislative piece is huge. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I feel so incredibly lucky, lucky our chief of programs, uh, Janae is a army veteran, mm -hmm. himself, West Point grad. And I feel like I've learned so much from her um, just around the challenges of female veterans. And, and she's the first one, you know, we'll be talking about something and she'll, she'll automatically bring in like, all right, how is this going to work for our, our female veteran population? And she was actually one of our first, our, our, one of our big programs at the foundation is called Character Does Matter. And we train veterans to deliver character education to uh, kids. Um, and so I'm um, really taking the fundamentals, like you're talking, the biggest thing you learned in the military was how to persevere, right? Well, how right. can you take that and speak to a bunch of kids and maybe 90% of them aren't going to join the military, but how can you share your experience in a way for them to build that character strength themselves? And Janae was actually one of our first, um, not just first female, she probably may have been even our first female character does matter mentor, but she was one of our first mentors. And I think she got so much about advocating for her service and talking about her service. So um, I, I just, I, I love, I love that campaign and I love everything that you're doing. And I think it is, it's about being loud. It's about being out there and not mm -hmm. in an abrasive way, but saying like, Hey, this is something we need to be paying attention to. Um, it's so important. Um, what do you think, uh, what do you think, you know, we talk a lot about leadership. Clearly I can, I can look at all the things that you're doing in your life and, and see that you're a tremendous leader, but how do you think the challenges you faced, you know, growing up as a military ki kid, competing in the world of, world of pageantry, serving in the military have made you a better leader? How do I think that growing up in the military and competing in pageantry has made me a better leader? I definitely think it's brought me down to earth, but I also think it's just shown me so many different personalities of people. Um, not only growing in the military, having to move around so much with my dad being restationed to different bases throughout the country, you're, you're really having to uh, learn to adapt. <laughs> and I feel like leadership is all about adapting. It's not only about adapting to your environment, which is what, you know, moving around has taught me, but it's also about adapting to different personalities, understanding people from all walks of life. I think one thing that's so great about pageantry is you think it's one type of woman that competes for pageants and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> these women are all very different yeah. <laughs> and a lot of I laugh because so many of my my closest friends I've met through pageantry and they're all so different um and somehow we we jumped into this weird world of gowns and dresses and makeup and have somehow you know found that common denominator amongst all of us but you have women that just come from so many different backgrounds have so many different desires and somehow at the end of the day have a platform and something that they're passionate about and they want to use pageantry to be able to, to, to encourage and pursue that. So I love that I can sit in almost any group of people, different personalities, different walks of life and still be able to blend and find my place. And I think that as a leader, you need to learn to lead different people. People that you lead are not always going to be the same. And you have to be able to understand how to be as adaptive as possible and understanding to the fact that there's so many differences. I actually was in company command. I was a commander of a petroleum lab unit out of Rockville, Maryland during my time as Miss USA, actually. And I had a good amount of soldiers that worked under me and they're all very different. And uh, the main thing that you need in a leadership position is respect going both directions. That's the problem with a lot of leaders. <laughs> they think that respect only flows this way. And that's not how this works. There needs to be respect going both directions. And that was very important to me because I've had my fair share of terrible, toxic leaders that I've worked under. And they were everything that I didn't want to be. And when I finally took company commands and took over and, and had all these great soldiers, I had to learn how it is that I can respect them without losing um, their respect and, and making sure that they understand 
who's the leader in this role and then often allowing them to lead sometimes because they're subject matter experts in their own right. And what it is that I'm doing to show them that I respect what it is that they bring to the table is important too. So it's a few different things, but I definitely think being as adaptive as possible is probably one of the best things. I, I share your adaptiveness. Um, I, (laughs) one of, one of the things growing up, you know, I was born at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. I lived in California. I lived in DC. I lived in Maryland, Pennsylvania. Um, and growing up, I hated it. There was, Mm. I hated more than my dad saying, this is where we're going next. And, Mm -hmm. Um, and I always felt somewhat cheated. I used right. to talk about this idea that, you know, I remember when we, my dad left active duty and we moved to Pennsylvania outside of Philadelphia, um, all like the, the friends that I met, they would all be like, Oh, we've been friends since kindergarten. Oh, our, we've been friends since birth. Our mom gave birth in the same room together. <laughs> and I, I felt kind of cheated that I never had that, you know, that right. I was never going to have that friend that had been with me since we were little. Right. And, um, right. and then I realized I did have that. I had that in my brother. He went through that same thing with me. We were 15 months apart. So just like you and your siblings we were very close in age. Mm-hmm. And so we shared those experiences together. And now looking back in my adulthood, I feel so lucky that I was able to experience all these different places, all these, di- you know, uh, living in North Carolina is way different than living in Monterey, California, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it is, it's a, it's a, there's cultural differences just between mm-hmm. the states. And, and so I look back on that as actually something that, that helped me um, and has helped me in the same way it's helped you. You know, my kids are, my kids have never left the same town they're in. And on some levels, I'll turn to my husband sometimes and be like, I feel like we just got to do something different. We have to we have to get them into a different environment and have them experience different things. And so um, I agree with that. And, you know, the other thing I was thinking about, and I love what you said, respect has to come from both ways. A lot of times the quote leaders think it just comes from you, you need to respect me. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I keep in my desk drawer at work is a piece of paper. It's literally on a, a, a piece of, you know, legal legal paper. And it was a note that was in my brother's footlocker that came home mm-hmm. from Iraq. And, you know, Travis wrote a lot of notes, took a lot of, you know, wrote things down, put his thoughts down. And one of the things he had on bold on a piece of paper, I folded up in my desk drawer, said, you don't have to like your men, but you have to love and respect them. And absolutely. And I, and I, I look at that and I'm like, yeah, listen, I'm not going to like, and when I say like, it means I'm not, that not everybody that I, that I'm around is going to be somebody that I want to go get a beer with or that mm-hmm. I can be friends with outside of my professional work. But at the end of the day, I have to love and respect them and I have to understand their value and what they bring to the, the, the work that we're doing. And That's so incredibly important. And it's something I have to remind myself too, because I think you can, it's one thing just to say that, and it's another thing to, to live by it. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and even for myself, I I need those reminders sometimes. Hence why I keep it in my drawer that I have to open up quite frequently. And it's just Mm -hmm. right there, fold it up and I'm like, good reminder, you know? So, Mm -hmm. um, I love that. Uh, Deshauna, I, I love everything that you represent. We have to work more with you and, and Swan. Absolutely. Um, certainly a- outside of this conversation, I want to see how we can further work together and, um, you know, advance um, everything for that we can for female veterans and, and our military community as a whole. Um, I thank you for joining us on the Resilient Life podcast today. And I want to leave you with one final question that we ask all of our guests at the end. Um, I feel like you've answered it in a thousand of the questions that I've asked <laughs> you today, but what qualities about yourself um, do you feel make you resilient? And, and what do you think it is and, and what do you think it means to live a resilient life? I definitely say perseverance. I think that's probably the biggest characteristic. And what it means is that when times get hard, I push through. When doors are slammed in my face, I find ways to open them. 
Uh, I remain as faith-filled as possible when, in, when times are hard. I definitely think after the global health pandemic and things going on around the world, it's very hard to get down. It's very easy to get down on yourself. So perseverance is something that I appreciate about myself is my ability to, to never get up, never give up, keep pushing through, keep trying. And I think that's probably the biggest uh, defining factor in my opinion for what it means to live a resilient life. I, I think you are the definition of perseverance. Um, I thank you for joining us here today. And I look forward to everyone hearing this incredible conversation and um, hearing more about your story. Uh, we'll put the link to the SWAN Network so you can learn more about that and how you can get involved. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Resilient Life Podcast. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe.